Hello, travelers. This is Paula Schmidt, and welcome to my theater of the mind, Evening's Kingdom. I have a surprise. If you're enjoying the show, you may want to visit eveningskingdom.com because I'm now sharing book one for free on my website. A lot of you have said how much you'd like to be able to read the story. Maybe you even prefer reading your fiction allotments over listening to it. So now you can via eveningskingdom.com. I hope you enjoy this story and would love to know your thoughts. So let me know in a comment or via my website. This is Paula Schmidt, and thank you so much for listening. Today's episode comes from a driveway. (laughs) I'm in our schoolie parked in front of our dear friend Abby's house in beautiful South Carolina. So please forgive any funky sounds. We continue. Chapter 3 nor tensing. There had been a great sickness at Oculus, and this was why where Rothwell now explained to the frightened soldiers gathered before him. So many holies had suddenly vanished without a trace, for they'd not died in the ordinary way and had to be removed. But the soldiers assigned to remove them, where Rothwell went on, they had died too. The bodies of men and women strong and healthy just the night before singing along with the rest of them, were found all about the sacred mountain palace, curled up like infants, their faces and limbs swollen beyond all recognition. Mount Oculus, the place of royal communion with Godex, the most sacred site in all of Tensingland, cursed, or they were cursed, Lear Rothwau said. The soldiers shifted uneasily before him, murmuring, Death! The oligarch said, his voice booming across the courtyard. Death is the great advisor. He slammed his fist on the railing of the palace stair for order. Be still and hear me, ye men, women, thirdlings of Tensingland. You who are the eyes, arms, and daggers of the king himself. And what does death teach us? To live as though each moment is our last. And thanks be to Godex, the thousand for all they have chosen to allot us within this mortal coil. The martial procession, returning back down the mountain to Chalice, was small, hastened, and very pale. And yet, Nor was changed. He decreed the dams around Chalice be open to share royal water reserves with the villagers, that all the tribes, even the Chiriklo and jungle peoples, be treated with dignity and respect effective immediately, and that this was to be enforced by law as his officers saw fit. Nor's military began to swarm within and throughout Chalice, and for the first time, all castes of the starving peoples came forwards and tasted equality, where Rothwell was discontent. He called a gathering of the oligarchs in secrecy to the grotto beneath Chalice and together the ancients walked the great alley in formal silence, all the way to the great wide stairs at the far end of the grotto, climbing directly up the cliff to a river altar carved high above the Eel River. They filed out, oligarchs fat and thin, young and old, though even the youngest had outlived two full generations of villagers. Oligarchs age much more slowly than ordinary mortals. Together they stood on the wide ledge far above the roaring river. One of the youngest, a small, rounded woman with black hair and very red ears, rocked forwards on her toes. She shook her head. The people's eyes are opened and will not be closed. We have lost our influence over them. Beside her, an elder shook his massive, shaggy head. Greed will close every eye, he said, clasping his hands together over his large belly. It is a simple question. How to make them sleep again. Where Rothwell, the king's advisor, smiled. Indulgence, my friends. With indulgence. We make the military as soft as we've made the ten sinks. As soft as a child's cheek. Softest of beds. 
the most charming of the holies. The finest foods, the strongest milk. The black-haired woman looked up at this, eyes bright. He went on. Comforts and indulgences, what can these do but create greed for more? And greed will core them, as a beetle devours through wood, making them soft, flexible. This is how we make them soft and rotten to their core. Jealous of one another's possessions, we shall decree far greater wages to the highest-ranking officers, so that each receives more than the rank just beneath them, and so on. Inequity breeds mistrust, greed, fearfulness of loss. This is how, and Nortensing's foolish measures will collapse of their own weight from the top down. The other oligarchs went on nodding, pleased, all except for an elegant woman and a fine billowing captain whose cloth was the color of sunlight. She looked from one face to the next intently. But this king could also be killed, she said. As was his father, there is a drought. There is unrest, where Rothwell shook his head. The people in the military love this king too much. They love the changes he's made if we kill him. It will only strengthen his revolution. You are biased, she said. For he is yours, is he not? Not so, where Rothwell said. I am ours. And so he is ours. My lady, I am but the tongue that bridles an unruly mind and would see it brought quiet. She bared her teeth at him in a cold smile. Can it be you believe your own lies? The shaggy oligarch steepled his fat, sausage-like fingers in irritation. Nor Tensing's ideas are new. And the people are fickle. So the king wants us to preserve the low tribes well and good. We shall pass a tax, which must be paid by anyone found guilty of harming a chirclo or jungle creature. A tax to be paid directly to the soldier who discovers harm. Ah, said the elegant oligarch, her face lit up with pleasure. Nor's soldiers will hunt the people. The people will fear them, and the changes will sleep. This can be done the fierce woman said, and the shaggy oligarch bowed his head in courtly assent. Where Rothwell only crossed his hands behind his back, smiling, he knew when to hold his tongue. But in his mind, he spoke to himself with satisfaction. Just so. Chapter 4 Uma Uma looked up from her patient to the village girl sitting anxiously across from her. Your mother is very sick. Uma said. But you can help her, the girl said. She'd arrived with her dying mother drawn behind her in a sled, in hopes of meeting Uma, the famous Wutar healer, under cover of darkness. Uma shook her head, putting her hand on the girl's shoulder. She will die, possibly tonight. The Yang villager trembled. Slender as a blade of grass, she had a large forehead and big, worried eyes. Her voice was a sad whisper. She's all I have, she said. She won't let herself die until she believes I'll be all right without her. I want to let her go, I do, but I don't know that I will be all right. I love her so much. She drew in a ragged breath, shaking her head. We have a place in town for the women and children to go. I, I can't run it alone. But I know I should want to let her go. I do. She's suffering. It's wrong for her to have to fight to stay for our sake, for my sake. But I... I Uma opened her arms, and the girl clung to her instantly. But just as quickly, she shrank back, frightened of Uma. She'd never even seen a Wutar before. Had only seen the paintings, heard the stories... As they spoke, Uma felt the mother's awareness on them. And more than that, Uma felt the enemy healer's intelligence moving curiously around the small, cozy interior of her medicine cart, even as the dying woman lay motionless between them on the floor. The daughter looked up at the painted ceiling. I'm ready, she said, trying to square her shoulders and not quite able to meet Uma's eyes. I don't want her to suffer. I want her to be free. Briefly, she sobbed. She would never want me to suffer, yet my need of hers brought her much suffering. Uma drew back so the girl could calm herself down. She would need to learn how to do that now. 
You will see, she said, when the girl was quiet again. Dying is like being born. We return back into the mystery we came from. You have been there before, and so has she. But you can see it, the girl said. Right now, all around us. Yes, I can see it, Uma said. Maybe we Yang have forgotten how to see it, the girl said raggedly. Or we don't want to. We we never did to admit how little we know, how little control we have. Is it peaceful? You must hate us. All that we've done to you, your people. Uma was silent, gesturing for the girl to kneel at her mother's head. She put the hand drum beside her. Are you going to kill her? The girl said. No, Uma said. I will bring you both into the mystery so you can make your peace with her passage. Then your mother's soul will journey on whenever she is ready. My gift is to place you together on the bridge, not to take your journey for you. Do you understand? Why why do you do this for us? Help Yang. Uma looked at her. You are here. We are not so different. Here, the girl looked around at the holy space within the medicine cart. Between them, the dying woman's mouth curved into a faint smile. She was so close to death that her skin was clammy to the touch, but somehow she found the strength to nod. Her eyes snapped open, clear as wells, driven deep into her skull by the pain, and yet the calm and strength radiating from the other healer, even as she lay dying was mesmeric to Uma. Then, slowly, the woman's magnificent eyes closed again, and a deeper darkness seemed to descend upon the little room. Your mother is a great healer, isn't she? Uma said. Her strength of will alone, she... I understand why your village sorrows. The daughter nodded, her mouth twisting down. Uma stroked the woman's forehead tenderly. Yes, the mystery is peaceful. You'll see, with her tonight, and you will come back reassured. The mystery is always with us. It is us. We belong to it, and it belongs to us. The girl went on nodding, rhythmically, as Uma lit the ceremonial incense. The scent becalmed the girl still further, and Uma knelt beside the dying woman, closing her eyes. Her senses swept out like a current and quickly pooled around the sickness she found rooted inside the woman. It was from the woman's patience, Uma saw. The village healer had not known how to safely dispose of the dark energy she cleansed from others. She'd taken it from them and worn it herself instead, until slowly it fed deep inside her, a cancer seeping from her skin into her bones and organs. The healer's eyes opened again, studying Uma calmly. Uma met the intelligent gaze and smiled back. The woman did not move, did not regret, merely registered Uma's silent diagnosis. So, that is why the Yang healer's thoughts spoke into Uma's. I always hoped I would keep learning until the day I died. You'll go on learning, Uma thought back to her. You won't be your small self any longer. You'll be one with all the mystery, learning everything it knows. I like that. The woman's chest fell. Tell me, Wutar, what should I have done instead? Uma looked at her kindly. You carried burdens not yours to bear. We can help others find ways to lessen their own burdens, but it is not for us to carry the weight for them. If we succeed in helping another remove an energetic illness, we must dispose of it energetically too, so it does not infect you or any other. The daughter's head was bowed. She could hear nothing of this wordless exchange between the healers. There was profound love between mother and daughter, Uma knew, and yet, too, an impossible disconnect. Uma smoothed back the woman's hair. Are you ready? she said silently, into the other healer's mind. Again came that dashing little half-smile, and the woman spoke without words. I will see you on the other side. 
By degrees, Uma leaned forward, slowly, so as not to startle him. She kissed the woman's forehead, and then she bit her. The dying healer's skin was so crisp and dry that Uma felt it part under her fangs. The blood welled into Uma's mouth, and with it flowed the healer's energy, calm and curious, ready to be free of its dying vessel. The healer would leap into death, Uma knew, and disappear into the mystery the moment she arrived, so ready was her spirit to explore and grow. Her life had been exceptional, and yet also a cocoon for whatever her spirit would become next. And Uma hoped she might see what this would be. She bound the other healer's energy ever so slightly with the lightest of energetic filaments so she would not float free of her mortality too quickly. A gift for your daughter, Uma explained. The girl, so you can stay just a little longer, if that is what you want. Hearing Uma's voice in her mind, the woman's spirit focused again. Yes, a little longer for her. Uma returned to ordinary reality, still aware of the woman's spirit at the outer band of her shamanic consciousness, a brilliant, spreading light. Now she bent towards the weeping daughter, kissing the girl's hot forehead, and gently stroked her hair to one side. She bit the warm, sweet neck and drank lightly, a gentle sting, to help the girl come alongside them, up beyond the ordinary world or into the realm of the divine. The girl's blood was lovely, bright and simple and utterly responsive. All her life she'd been her mother's assistant, after all. And now, at the lightest direction, the girl's energy instantly leapt forward into the higher space and found her mother's. Uma felt their energies meet, tightly at first, and then with fearless joy, but she paused before rising to join them, to lead them onwards. For Uma to drink any more from the healer now was not necessary to do the work required. And yet, she was already craning towards the dying woman. Quickly, she bent to the wound in the fragile neck, and before she could stop herself, drank deeply. The woman's beautiful, nourishing energy was both fire and balm surging with vitality, with power, and Uma felt Laxus, the snake god, alive within the tattoos he'd engraved on her skin. She felt his presence awake and swirl around her, silently seething out. Not all of it, the healer's voice said to Uma, suddenly, not just yet. And shame would have coursed through Uma then, but for the woman's beautiful, animating blood. She nodded, wiping her mouth discreetly. Of course. Forgive me, she said, her own spirit ascending to join theirs, the mystery. She guided them through the shamanic realms of the upper world, quieting the girl's heart with gladness, quickening the woman's with eagerness to learn, to dissolve into light and knowing. I will miss you always, my mother, the daughter said, but I feel how happy you are here. I am happy here the healer said, and I have very much to do, worlds to learn, but she was struggling now to remain individuated, ecstasy was taking her, but you, my daughter, you will always be my baby. At this, Uma bowed her head and stepped away. When she looked again, the girl was alone, drifting peacefully in the cool, holy light, and Uma took her hand, guiding her slowly back down into her body. The girl lay curled beside the mother. Uma covered them with a blanket. Both women lay smiling. Just before sunrise, Uma helped the daughter harness the sled to her lope, a well-fed buck with rouged horns who kept throwing his head back, trying to look towards the healer's wrapped body. The daughter was almost smiling, although her eyes were tired. And sad. He's wondering why I bother to keep the husk of her, she said. I suppose the inclinations of people make no sense to a lope. Uma, I thank you for everything. Blessings for your journey, truly. Uma bowed. The girl's eyes were wet as she turned away, smiling. 
May the fullness smile on you. And on you. Dawn began to light the mountains in the distance behind them. And Uma threw her arms around Silver and her cat leg. Anyway, uh, Lope can't make sense of himself either. Otherwise, he'd never let himself be tamed, she said. The girl laughed. This is why you prefer the catlings. Uma shook her head. Because they are with us only because they wish to be. Chapter 5 King Nortensing A Grave of Blooded Stone And still Godix withheld the reins from Chalice. Nor was despondent. He'd heeded Nezhmi's ghost, and yet he'd failed. Returning from a parley with his officers outside the capital city, he was staggered by the skeletal villagers he saw in the streets, when suddenly his procession lurched to a stop. An accident. A butcher had overturned his cart into a stall of vendors, and now one of them, a fruit seller, stood holding a dead baby in her arms. For a moment, the starving woman only stood, hollow with shock. Then she lunged at the driver with a wild scream, and others seethed in after her. Before Nor's eyes, the dusty alley foamed into a riot as starving villagers dragged away the butcher's meat from his overturned cart. Then, when the man fought, they came for the butcher too. Nor's carriage was swiftly redirected. Foot soldiers dispatched to reinstate order, but not before Nor saw the meat being torn apart in the street. The dead antelope's eyes blind as pigeon eggs, their long, fragile legs waving girlishly in the air. The villagers ripped the carcasses apart, and suddenly, Nor imagined he saw Nezhmi dead among them. And with Nezhmi was the face of his murdered father, and his own face too, all ripped to threads by the angry mob. I've failed, Nor said, quietly. General Pow turned to him, Your Highness. Nor shook his head. You are not safe with me any longer, my old friend. Soon the people will scream for my blood. I have nothing else to drink. Sovereign, it's my sworn duty to protect you. Pau reached out, hesitating when she saw her friend's face, for Nor looked hollow as a skull. I don't deserve that, he said. She took his hand in her own. It will rain again, one day. Nor shook his head. I was wrong, and look how Chalice suffers. For my folly, but you aren't wrong. We only need one good rain, and then all your plans will work. It takes time to undo. You know I've come to believe there is no I, only we, he said. Goddix, a name for something, an energy within us all, flowing through everything. My rain is only to clear space for that flow, to protect it from those who would try to constrict it. That is what I believe, but what if I'm wrong, pal? Nothing is working. I don't know what to do. I'm wrong. You are not wrong, my sovereign, Pow said firmly. She'd been calling him that more often lately, as if to remind Nor who he was. But Nor could not meet her eyes. The people withered, and many died. For the sacrifice of the elder king had changed nothing, and now, like the sky itself, Nor also turned his face away from his people. He looked instead towards the blunting solace of alcoholic mouth, and all that had quicked in him turned once again to stone, and spread its cold spell across the kingdom, and what was good slept, slipping deeper and deeper into the earth, beneath the retreating waters of Chalice. Chapter 6 Fern a thousand. A sea of cheerglow caravans stood in the shadow of Cloud Abbey, the final stretch of green fields which bordered the singing sands. The caravans who pledged themselves to Ogadai's plan had kept their word, and not since the cheerglow first dispersed so many generations ago had so many gathered into one place mountain tribes and lake dwellers, river folk and sand casts alike. Here they would pass the season together, until it was cool enough to begin the crossing towards Ulali. And Fern saw the boy on the first night. She was helping her father, Ogadai, 
mend a cracked wheel when the boy wandered past. Tall, easy shadow. Somehow, that made her look up. He seemed half boy and half smoke, all shadow and drift. He didn't pause once, just went on sauntering off between the caravans. She wasn't even sure if he'd seen her. And there was something about him, something not quite tangible, she thought, as if he existed more completely in dreams, held himself apart from the reality all around them. Like me, <laughs> Fern thought. Suddenly, she was hotly aware that Ogadai had noticed it. The electric current between the two young adults as they coolly registered one another. Fern looked down quickly at the cracked wheel, avoiding her father's eyes. Oh, don't say anything, she thought. Please don't ruin it by saying anything. Ogadai was silent. But he was smiling, and that was just as bad. I got it from here, Fern, he said then, infuriatingly. Why don't you, uh, go on, have a look around camp? Oh, she said. Sure. She started to wander off in the direction the boy had gone, but then came back. Forget something, Fern, Ogadai said, still grinning. Fern reached into the family wagon to scoop up her slingshot. Got it, Fern said. See ya. And with a wink, she was off. Hello, travelers. This is Polish Mint, and thank you for listening. If you're enjoying the story, please click over to eveningskingdom.com for your free copy of book one. And well, may it please you. I also have a bunch of fun free stuff there to check out. Stories to listen to, books you can buy, etc., etc. So click around. In next week's episode, we're about to go deep into Fern's world as she falls head over heels for a lovely someone. Uma has a major vision, and the great gathering of Chiriklo from all across the kingdom make their crossing to Ulali to seize the ancient castle back from the occupying gang forces. Please stay tuned. The rest of the story is just down the road.